This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Greg Gilchrist, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Dan DeMarco, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode entitled Lies, Spies, and Wirecard, we look at BDO's investigation into the Philippines, why is the Wirecard Board of Directors afraid to meet in a conference room with Windows, why is there no interest in any of the assets in the bankruptcy court, what did the initial insolvency report say, and the continuing adventures of Jan Marsalek, all on lies, spies, and Wirecard. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Mikhail Reader Gordon, and we are back for another episode in the ever continuing saga of Wirecard. Mikhail, first of all, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. Uh, always delighted to be back. And yes, we have an all new episode of As the Card Turns. You have provocatively named this Lies, Spies, and Wirecard. So why don't you just get right into it? Okay. Well, let's start with our weekly roundup. Um, You know, (laughs) we all know that uh, after our our summer uh, hiatus, right, we brought listeners up to speed last week, covering all that went on whilst we were away. Now, uh, right, if this were some run-of-the-mill corporate scandal, there may not be much to say after seven days. But, folks, let's face it, this is no ordinary scandal. Wirecard soap opera, swindle story, shocking tale with a free show of schadenfreude all in one. New revelations this past week? Absolutely. They will. They'd never let us down. All right. The mundane BDO Unibank in the Philippines this week confirmed that the missing $2.1 billion in cash never entered the Philippine financial system. Let's admit it. Their own FIU folks had already observed that such a huge sum would hardly go unnoticed in that country. Still, BDO had conducted an internal investigation and confirmed what everyone already knew. And meanwhile, Bank of the Philippine Islands, oh, they had to suspend one of their assistant managers, who apparently was complicit in the fabrication of false documents shown to the auditors to support the whole notion that Wirecard Holding uh, had its trust accounts out in the Philippines. BPI claims it's still investigating this junior bank employee, but we can anticipate that not much more will come out of that. So let's turn to what really moves this never-ending saga along. We start with learning that Wirecard filed for bankruptcy. We knew that. But when it did, the company's board members so feared they'd be attacked, huh? they refused to meet in rooms with open windows. We haven't heard of any angry mobs besieging Wirecard's offices of yet. Uh, Perhaps it's just the guilt of having been on the governing body overseeing such an epic corporate failure that is feeding their paranoia. And speaking of the bankruptcy, oh dear. Recall that when insolvency administrator Michael Yaffa initially opened the proceedings, it was anticipated that some hundred plus corporate suitors would be snapping up all of that perceived value of Wirecard was ostensibly sitting on. Last week, we learned Deutsche Bank thought the price for some of the assets was a wee bit high, and they backed out. This week, we learned there's a general decline in interest related to Wirecard's assets. Solaris Bank AG had said it was giving a Wirecard a close look and came away determined not to make an offer. Solaris Bank CEO Roland Foles and his institution uh, said they weren't interested, not even for Parts of Wirecard. Yikes. Not even worse, scrap parts. As a consolation, Solaris did pick up a few straggler former Wirecard middle managers. So, Bolt's really got a gift without purchase. Who's left the shoppers? Three contenders are known to still be queuing at the fire sale. Banco Santander, Leica Mobile, and SIA, an Italian payments company. German company Unser apparently rapidly lost interest So it would appear the Germans have taken themselves out of the bidding entirely. I guess the notion of buy local only carries so far. What could possibly have put Deutsche and Solaris Bank off Wirecard? Administrator Jaffa's preliminary assessment report to the Munich District Court could very much be a factor here. 
He only just took the job, you say. What can he possibly have identified so soon? <laughs> ah, well, it is WireGuard. Recall when Yatha's press release came out back in July 1st with news of his appointment, he said the primary objective was to stabilize the business operations of Wirecard's group of companies. He also wrote that Wirecard was still solvent and that payouts to merchants and customers were being carried out, quote, without restrictions. In parallel, he was searching for investors for the core activities of Wirecard AG, as well as for the subsidiary business units. He was heartened by the interest investors from around the globe were expressing, and it was all quite sunny and promising. However, the last paragraph of Yafa's press release was one sentence only. It said, quote, In addition, the clarification of the causes of the crises, as well as the analysis and verification of class cash flows and data, were being progressed with high priority. And this one little statement has had big repercussions. Now, we've discussed some of the causes already, you know, money laundering for all manner of transnational organized crime, fraud. Listeners, if you're new to this series, quick, go back, listen to episodes three and five. But there were other factors as well. Harry Yoffa has been looking into those causes behind Wirecard's implosion. He issued a 359-page preliminary insolvency report to the Munich court. And the initial finding, it doesn't paint a picture of a company with value to spare. Yava has found that Wirecard's claim of generating 1.9 billion euro in pre-tax profits between 2015 through first quarter 2020, that's this year, total rubbish. Yep. Excise those fraudulent transactions from the Asian regional group, you know, Singapore with its fake trustee accounts and the Philippines with business partners that didn't exist. And you know what's left? Nothing. That's right. Take away only one region from Wirecard's global operations, and what is left? Losses. High dollar losses, to be fairly precise. 740 million euro in pre tax losses for the same time period, 2015 to first quarter 2020. That's right, listeners. Wirecard, at least for the past five years, they weren't profitable in any way, shape, or form. How did this not come out sooner? How did shareholders not know they had invested in a loss-making company? Uh, <clears throat> we're looking at you, EY. Typically, control functions are part and parcel of audits. Nothing? Missed that, did you? Wirecard never reported its figures for its individual operations. It only reported what it claimed was total corporate revenue. And it used the fraud out of Asia and a couple of other subsidiaries to conceal the true losses. Yafa, in his report, estimates Wirecard's remaining value is somewhere just above 400 million euro. But when the wheels came off the wagon in June, it was holding 3.2 billion euro in debt. Talk about being upside down. Yafa's analysis highlighted one of the multiplicity of causes of their collapse. Corporate waste. Yep, spending like a drunken sailor. Accounts being scrutinized by forensic auditors? Who cares? Hire more people. Lots more. In fact, fully 25% more. That's right. When KPMG was there, sniffing about, Wirecard went on a hiring spree. Short sellers asking awkward questions? Spend! When the shite hits the fan, so to speak, round about late June of this year, Wirecard was burning through 10 million euro a week. It's rather good that it all fell apart when it did because its trajectory was on course to increase to spending 15 million euro a week. Quick math for some of you, that comes to about 200 million a quarter. Yafa's report identified that Wirecard would have had to go back to the trough come late December just to raise more money to pay its bills and keep the lights on. They were out of runway again or as they so eloquently stated on their website recently, they had, quote, created considerable overcapacities. <laughs> Remember Pets.com, the company with a sock puppet at its mascot? Now, one year earned 619000 in revenue, but spent $11.8 They're looking positively frugal next to Wirecard. 
Yaffa also found Wirecard was a complete shambles when it came to cybersecurity and IT infrastructure. You heard this correctly. The fintech, emphasis on tech, you know, the one that was ostensibly processing millions of financial transactions around the world via advanced technologies, handling all of that sensitive customer data. Well, what little tech they did have functioning, and think of that old Tandy you first had in 1980, now duct taped together and maybe being operated by your geeky second cousin living in the basement of his mother's house in Croydon. It kind of equivalent. No, really. Yoffa found that one of Wirecard's IT teams who worked in Athens, but were attached to a subsidiary with headquarters in New Zealand, that remit for the team, provide IT services to Wirecard's headquarters in Germany. Only it turns out when Yaffa dug into it, their IT services to the Munich offices weren't actually needed, only no one had noticed. This stunning ignorance is a common theme in Yaffa's report on Wirecard. No one on staff at Wirecard actually knew what was going on anywhere in the company. Not much was captured or recorded. And besides, none of the internal software and systems connected or spoke to one another. So who would know? Who knew? Who would know? Nothing was being accurately tracked. Yava found that, quote, a fraction of the staff was actually necessary. All the rest of the employees, essentially there to keep the fraud alive. Where were the risk officers, the compliance staff, the finance team? Where were the internal audit department and general counsel? How could so many employees genuinely not question what their company was doing and why there were so few controls in place? Now, that thought edges us toward our Wirecard theme today. Remember back in episode five, I mused out loud to Tom, what if Wirecard was never really intended to be profitable? What if it was always intended to be just a well-concealed but very public laundromat for criminals and Russian oligarchs? Was it this decade's BCCI? How could so many be complicit? Russia fits rather snugly in both this greater saga and in our topic today. Now, listeners, you're no doubt familiar with the recent leak of the trove of historic FinCEN data that the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists have been combing through for the past few months. And this data and the data are largely suspicious activity reports, or SARS, if you're in the geeky AML world, like me. This data came from a breach and was shared with the investigative reporting group. Well, ICIJ have shared a tiny portion of that raw data. Wish you'd share more, hint, hint. Still, they have made available in CSV format a transactions map, if you will, where one can look up a favorite financial institution or relationships between banks sourced from these SARs. They have not shared account holder names, the narratives of the SARs, or any of the really juicy bits. However, riffling through the data, I located our favorite bank, Wirecard. Now, the data is old, dates back somewhere between 6 and 20 years, depending on the any individual transaction. But history has its place. We've got a little string to tug from that big ball of yarn we call Wirecard. Specifically, there are two clusters of transactions involving Wirecard Bank. One batch from December 2013 and another batch from June 2014. A total of only 12 direct transactions. Not much. But these historic SAR filings that were submitted to FinCEN over a number of years and first leaked by a former FinCEN official who has since pled guilty for leaking said documents. Okay, back to the data. With this specific handful of Wirecard Bank transactions, in every instance, the SARS were filed by BNY Mellon. BNY Mellon was acting as the clearing bank here, and all transactions are monies coming from third-party institutions into Wirecard Bank in Germany. At first glance, the specific transactions into Wirecard accounts, Bank of Bermuda, several Philippine banks, DBS Bank in Singapore, Czech Bank, some international correspondent banks based out of the U.S. and Canada, banks for banks, if you will. The amounts aren't staggering. Some involve multiple transactions on the same date from the same originating institutions. But Wirecard was global. It processed transactions from its subsidiaries and partners around the globe. So, so far, so superficially benign. Except, recall, 
Clearing Bank BNY Mellon filed SARS. So a massive institution that clears billions of dollars of transactions a day on behalf of FIs around the world found compelling reason to suspect these particular transactions were not what they claimed to be. And this is where it starts to get truly intriguing. I did a little date sorting and analysis of those transactions on the same dates bracketing the transfer funds into Wirecard and also running through BNY Mellon. And here's what starts to pop out. Money to and from Austria, right, home of Herr Marsalek and Braun. Mauritius, remember the supposedly publicity-shy private equity firm based in Mauritius that at Marsalek's direction had Wirecard pay millions in order to require a cheap Indian company, MI's tickets, but turned out it was a round-tripping scheme? Oh, yeah, and some banks in the Philippines associated with the Wirecard fraud out there, BDO Unibank. Turkey, the UAE, Caracal. Remember Wirecard client, the binary option company, Option 888 was based out of there. Latvia, Cyprus, home to bank to binary. And Philippines fraud front company, PayEasy. And as we'll see, lots of ties between Wirecard and Russia. In fact, it's where they converge. Oh, yeah. And the other transactions bracketing the Wirecard to and from Russia. And the money movement a lot of Russian and Philippines evidence some truly intriguing money flows. Again, ICIJ, please share more info. So we arrive at today's big theme, lies, spies, and wire card. Now, no episode of this series would be complete without a mention of Jan Marsalek. We're actually going to talk about him quite a bit. His ears will be burning, so here we go. Marsalek is a central figure in all of this. Recall, he's thought to be tucked up in Russia, counting his bitcoins and biding his time. And we've covered quite a bit of his history as former COO of Wirecard. Not satisfied with his $2.7 million a year compensation package with Wirecard, Jan is thought to be the mastermind behind both the business line facilitating high volume laundering and the fraud that brought the company down. In past episodes, we discussed his bribing Philippine officials to fake records to make it appear he entered that country on his way to China, dissected his relationship with PayEasy's Christopher Bauer, another enigma, covered Bellingcat's examination of Marsalek's frequent trips to Russia over the past decade, and analyzed Russian news outlet The Bell's interviews of bankers in Russia who say Marsalek was visiting for the purpose of purchasing a Russian bank. We've spoken of his multiple passports. Austrian, multiples of, German, Philippine, Caribbean island nation, one or two others. We've even briefly touched on European law enforcement sources who say Marsalek is a Russian asset. So let's pull that thread because the latest rumor is that an individual wishing to remain anonymous has allegedly put a 3.5 million euro bounty on Marsalek's head. If we want to give more attention to the question of Russia being implicated in Wirecard, once again, we have to get back into our time machine. Some months ago, I mentioned that Marsalek was a person of interest to no less than three Western intelligence agencies, now believed to increase to five, but who's counting? Marsalek joined Wirecard the year Braun founded it. He started as a vice president at the tender age of 20. Oh, and he was also a school dropout. Supposedly, he was hired because he understood the mobile phone technology whack. Now, Bellingcat and Der Spiegel, in their expose, helped to place Marsalek as having regularly visited Russia as far back as 2004, just two years after Braun had gotten Wirecard launched. These were the early years when Wirecard's core client base consisted of porn sites and online gambling. Why would Russia be interested in an executive from a German fintech startup catering to porn and gambling? Well, you see... It isn't much fun looting and pillaging one's country if you can't spend the proceeds on luxury items and pirate swag. As so many kleptocrats and oligarchs discover after stealing from their fellow citizens, the problem is there isn't much in the way of goodies to buy in country. Russia isn't known for building yachts. It isn't known for making Birkin bags or producing the equivalent of Lucien Freud's and Jean-Michel uh, Basquiat's. Oh, sure, there's a Christie's down showroom down in Moscow. The covetable goods are in the West, along with jurisdictions that uphold the rule of law, which is important for kleptocrats and oligarchs. After all, 
It's such a bore trying to poison away all of one's enemies. It's good to have a reliable legal fora for business disputes and messy divorces. Russian officials, like corporate corrupt and despots in so many other countries, then and now, always need to find ways to move their money into the West. And Herr Marsalek? He wouldn't be the first Western executive to be compromised. And Wirecard? Certainly wouldn't be the first European bank to be hijacked by Russia either. It appears that it was when Marsalek was promoted up to Wirecard's management board in 2010, the deeper involvement between Russian intelligence and Marsalek really kicked into high gear. Marsalek began visiting Russia on average between once a quarter and once a month in those years. In 2015, records show the FSB began actively monitoring Marsalek's visits to and from Russia and other countries. The Russians, that is the government, its intelligence agencies, its oligarchs, and its organized crime bosses, <laughs> and I know we have difficulty distinguishing between them all, but they have a well-known method that serves their needs and those of the businesses and businessmen they support. In return for money flowing through, which is useful for propping up companies in need of cash, like Wirecard, Russian money can evade sanctions and be moved into the West. In turn, the thug life or those generous Russian benefactors, depending on your point of view, may seek certain favors. These favors can manifest themselves in a variety of ways, but typically they involve financial, air quote, support for off-the-books intelligence operations from those they patronize. What shape might such an operation take? Mm, political meddling, support for far-right parties in other countries, funding rebel groups, funding terrorism. The list goes on. Here's a recent example, and funny, it just happens to feature Russian support for far-right parties such as the Far-Right Freedom Party in Austria, known as FPO. Recall, only last year, Sebastian Kurtz, the chancellor, caught up in uh, the what was known the Abitha affair. It became known uh, because his then vice chancellor, Heinz Christian Strock, who was also leader of the FPO, and Strock's deputy FPO leader, were caught on a secret video camera meeting in Spain with a woman posing as the niece of a Russian oligarch and seemingly accepting Russian support for the forthcoming Austrian elections. Strzok had claimed to have traveled to Russia regularly and met with Putin advisors in an effort to, quote, strategically collaborate. The Ibiza affair brought the Austrian government down as the Freedom Party was part of the center-right Kurtz's coalition government. Now, Kurtz has obviously since recovered. What does this have to do with Wirecard? Well, it transpires both Marcus Braun and Marsalek held ties to the FPO and Kurtz's center-right People's Party, known as the OVP. Braun was appointed to Chancellor Kurtz's Think Austria strategy team and OVP think tank. Since the implosion of Wirecard, the Austrian press has turned up what they term to be intense links between Kurtz's OVP party, Braun, and Wirecard. Braun appeared with Kurtz in a campaign event in 2017, the same year he donated more than 70,000 euros to the party. But it was at this time that the OVP was in bed with FPO. And this is where Marsalek fits in. It has emerged that Marsalek had ties to Vienna's intelligence circles. So much so that Marsalek stands accused by Austria of passing classified information obtained from Austria's Secret Service and its Ministry of the Interior to the FPO and to contacts namely the finance secretary of the Austrian-Russian Friendship Society. Now, understand, this is not the sort of friendship society where everyone sits around braiding each other's hair and pinky-swearing besties for life. Russian friendship societies are covers for Russian intelligence operations. The society had members that included senior Austrian government officials and the usual chocolate box of assorted former politicos. And the FBO has actively and publicly advocated for a number of years, that Austria should build stronger ties with Putin's government. They even went so far as to forge a cooperation agreement with Putin's United Russia Party. Besties for life indeed. Marsalek allegedly passed state secrets into the hands of these fronts for Russian intelligence. But that isn't all. 
Austrian media outlet Der Standard reported that Marsalek was said to be an agent of the Austrian Secret Service. Hmm. If so, they lost control of their agent. The Financial Times in its investigation of Marsalek reported that he was posturing to business associates in London and in the process showed them highly sensitive documents that actually contained the recipe for Novichok. For those of you not up on your chemical and biological weapons, Novichok is a deadly nerve agent that the Russians cooked up decades back. They claim it is multiple stronger than VX, and Russia's security services, the GRU and the FSB, have an unhealthy attachment to using it to savagely dispatch those they find bothersome. The recipe is not something one downloads from the internet. It is highly classified, and very few people in the world have access to it. Novichok was the weapon used to poison Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny a few weeks ago. And it is the same chemical weapon that was used in 2018 by Russian GRU agents to poison Sergei Skripal and his daughter in Salisbury's England. That same attack, it killed one Brit and harmed three others. And recall, the last we heard from Marsalek's post-wirecard implosion, he was tucked up in Russia, hosted by the GRU. Marsalek was waving the recipe for Novichok around, the things one does to impress one's friends, right? As well as internal documents from the Vienna-based Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. The OPCW was investigating the scribble poisoning. In Austria, again, Marsalek allegedly obtained these documents from an Austrian source, had the information because it was the country that hosted the spy swap in 2011, where Skripal was exchanged into the West. We may think of Mr. Marsalek as a bit of a ponce, and we don't know the Novichok recipe or paperwork he bandied about was the Russian recipe, but it does support the idea that he held sufficiently deep connections to the Russians. He may have been a bit of an ingenue when he started dancing with the GRU, but his evolution from those early days in Russia in 2004 to around 2015 suggests the GRU knew how to manipulate him to their own ends. In 2017, Marsalek was sharing Austrian state secrets with Russian connections, and that was the same year that the FSB detained Marsalek on one of his trips in Russia. He was detained and subsequently released. A friendly chat? A check-in? While such an encounter is fairly typical of maybe recruiting patterns by the FSB, it may have been the FSB checking up on what the GRU's asset was up to. Because it was in 2017 that Marsalek also traveled out to Syria with Russian troops. Oh yes, folks, Marsalek fancied himself a regular James Bond. He was said to swan around with a metal credit card and play up his non-wire card activities. He got himself involved in a number of quote, projects linked to the Russian GRU. One of these projects was ostensibly dreamt up by Marsalek and involved a sudden interest on his part in helping to reconstruct Libya post-conflict. Sure, this was in 2015, and it was to be a humanitarian mission. Marsalek is said to have offered to pay the Russian Friendship Society to produce a report that would support his idea. And through the society, he actually managed to secure funding from various Austrian ministries, including the Ministry of Defense for this adventure. Those outside of the project's core circle apparently understood it to be nothing more than a cover for far less salubrious aims in Libya. He introduced, Marsalek that is, a group of Russians to serve as, quote, security to this so-called humanitarian reconstruction in Libya. And he worked on arranging equipment to be shipped out. And no, we're not talking about diggers. According to the FT, Marsalek was interested in using armed forces to control Libyan migrant flows across the border. He envisioned a 15,000 strong border police force. That's right, a school dropout with no training or education in diplomacy, security, or even international relations, who was the chief operations officer of a German fintech was ostensibly the mastermind behind an effort that would play directly into Russia's geostrategic ambitions of securing a greater role in the Near East and making a total pain in the ass of itself in the Mediterranean just to stick it to the EU and NATO. 
history buffs uh, go back to Soviet Union's relations in that region to see the original playbook. Thankfully for one and all, Marsalek was assisted by a former GRU officer of some standing, Andre Chuprian. We don't have time on this podcast to get into the details of this little venture, so I encourage listeners to read the full F- FT expose. However, it does bear mentioning another one of Marsalek's projects that involve Libya, Russia, and the Near East. This is a convoluted web of cover companies. Libyan Cement Company, or LCC, and hold on to that name, was sold by an Austrian conglomerate in 2015, hmm, same year, to Libya Holdings Group, or LHG. LHG claims their corporate raison d'etre to be one dedicated to partnering with investors who desire to become involved in Libyan business opportunities. (laughs) Is that what Russia is calling Russian mercenary activities these days? Business opportunities? (laughs) Putin is such a getter. LCC hired Russian company RSB Group to engage in what they euphemistically called demining operations in Libya. Only where they were performing these activities just happened to be in the part of Libya held by the warlord Khalifa Haftar, he who is supported by Russia. RSB likes to use FSB and Spetsnaz forces in all of its corporate activities. <laughs> Listeners, I know you're asking, but what does Herr Marsalek have to do with this? Ah, Mr. Marsalek applied to have a 20 million euro debt waiver granted by Austria against LCC's facilities. And Marsalek, he got the money. I expect there's some awkward conversations occurring in the halls of Austrian power now, but LCC, owner of LHG, well, one of those owners of LCC is Herr Marsalek himself. He was known to brag about his ability to secure Russian troops, sorry, security specialists, for business needs in Syria. Did I mention that Marsalek's home in Munich, that massive pile, it stood across the street from the Russian consulate. At least he didn't have to break a sweat going to and from the mothership. I want to return to this theme that Wirecard was never really more than just another Russian laundromat. And in future episodes, we're going to deep dive into some of these other Russian ties. But for now, as a teaser, let's take a gamble through the Wirecard fields where Russia sowed additional seeds. Remember in episode three, we discussed how FBME Bank in Cyprus was linked to Wirecard and a MasterCard executive involved in laundering for terrorist financing and organized crime? What we didn't cover then was that in 2019, it was determined that FBME was found to not only be linked to the Kremlin, but facilitating laundering and finance for Syria's chemical weapons program. FBME also laundered for Russian organized crime and others, you know, customer is a customer, ISIS, and an online porn baron, and not coincidentally, a key player involved with FBME, Mudlal Khori, a Syrian-Russian banker, who was accused of being involved in weapons procurement, including ties his to the Russian chemist Leonor Drink, who helped develop Novichok. What else was FBME involved with? The bank was known for its credit card and prepaid card division, capable of handling fraudulent transactions and those tied to online gambling and porn, including child porn, just like Wirecard. FB was a bank in name only. It was a Russian-sponsored laundromat, and we'll dive deeper into those and their ties to Wirecard in a future episode. But just think about it for a moment. So too was Malta-based Sada Bank, Fined in 2019 by the Maltese Financial Authority for at least 130 million euros plus of suspicious transactions passing through it. It's tied not only to money laundering, but to Wirecard and a Bulgarian named Christo Georgiev, the bank's owner. American intelligence is understood to have warned Malta's finance ministry that Sada Bank was implicated in Russian efforts financing Maltese operations involved in fuel smuggling and that the proceeds of those fuel sales were going to Syrian warlord, yep, you you got it right, listeners, Khalifa Haftar and his army. 
You remember Haftar, the one Marsalik was helping the Russians with? Now here's another teaser for our future episode on Sada and Wirecard. Georgiev, Europol tells us, is deeply tied to the Russian mafia. Georgiev's business partners include Wirecard exec Dietmar Nalkholman and Ruben Weigand. Remember Weigand now being prosecuted by DOJ for his role in the obscuring online cannabis sale transactions? Georgiev and his German partners have a dozen Maltese shell companies. Oh, and at least one in Florida, remember Michael Schutt? And one or two littered about the Caribbean. And through one of them, a connection is made between Georgiev, Nokelman, and two companies in Mauritius, Trident Trust and Emerging Markets Investment Fund. Yeah, that's right. The company Marsalik ran that deal through for Wirecard. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Paradise Papers, for those corporate filings. We won't keep pulling this thread quite yet, but as you can gather, listeners, there is much more to tell in this particular unraveling. And recall in episode four, when we start digging into the money laundering Wirecard facilitated, we mentioned bank to binary and the ICC binary option scandal in Israel. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. It promises to be a juicy episode. You just have to be patient. Well, there is another connection, one that ties to Russian organized crime in Eastern Europe. We're jumping ahead a bit, but one of the key players in the Israeli ICC scandal, Gal Barak, went on trial in Vienna, Austria this summer, charged with investment fraud and money laundering. Shortly before the trial started, his German business partner, Uwe Lenhoff, was found dead in his prison cell in Germany. Like Barak, Lenhoff was awaiting trial. However, Lenhoff was linked directly to organized crime in the Balkans and Eastern Europe. The binary option sites Barak and Lenhoff operated and there was a web of them, included options 888, which we discussed in a prior episode, and one company known as Global Payment Solutions. Ah, listeners, you recognize that one. They ran their transactions through Wirecard. The network included companies in the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, and beyond. And recall, former Wirecard exec Nochelman, he was the German married to the Israeli woman, so dual citizenship. He got convicted in Israel for his role in the ICC scandal. We digress. Uva and Barca's companies specialized in processing illegal payments and cryptocurrency transactions to both raise funds for organized crime and launder money. But Barak and Lenhoff's contacts ran much deeper than just organized crime. Despite being a, germ a dual German-Israeli citizen, Barak operated out of Bulgaria, and donated a lot of money to Bulgarian politics. Yeah, no connection to Russia there, right? In fact, when he invested in various establishments in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian prime minister personally would attend the openings. The Bulgarian minister of the interior gave awards to Barak. Until Lenhoff was arrested, he and Barak operated a global cybercrime organization that was expanding into online casino projects and boiler rooms in the Philippines, Philippines again, they ran a web of sites devoted to fraud that in some instances sent money into German companies who banked them via holding companies in Cyprus. <laughs> Full circle. Wirecard processed payments for this entire global network of fraudulently binary options industry. They were central to it. And Wirecard knew the money was dirty. <laughs> truth. Doesn't it sometimes feel like every last one of these thugs attended a corporate retreat where they were handed a playbook for the year? You can kind of see the Russian retreat leader. Okay, front companies, Cypriot banks, run it through Wirecard. Proceeds back to fund Russian-related political goals, clean the money to spend on projects. Okay, bring it in, group hug. Barak and Lenhoff reportedly were not squeamish about using bribery, threats, and even assassination to achieve corporate goals. But then organized crime in the Russians never have been squeamish. As I said, we'll devote an entire episode to this thuggish lot and their deep ties to Wirecard, so look for it. And then there's the mysterious Grigory Kuznetsov, the EVP of Global Financial Services, Wirecard Asia, PTE, you know, out there in Singapore, where so much of the core fraud was executed at the behest of Marsalik. Maybe that's the wrong word to use. We'll discuss Kuznetsov in another episode, but he appears to have been placed there specifically by Marsalik. So let's talk dirty money. This is, after all, at the core of Wirecard. Proceeds of all manner of depredations, counterfeit drugs, the proceeds of illegal trade, illegal timber logging, illegal mining, 
the trafficking of all sorts, people, narcotics, arms, endangered animals, smuggled cigarettes, body parts, online gambling, exploitation, porn, internet scams, credit card, and ID theft, binary option schemes. And the takings are all commingled and tumbled about with the entangled and corrupt monies that come from shady political deals, state-run banks bled dry, nepotism, businesses allowed to use child labor, the takings from extortion, dodgy tax deals. They all coalesce around the special purpose investment vehicles, cryptocurrency, even the profits of legitimate sales, and they move from bank to bank. The earnings go on to prop up politicians, fund campaigns to bring others down. They are the monies that fund rebel groups and terrorists. These profits fund weapons of mass destruction and pay to rig elections. They pay to kill stories or the journalists who write them. And they feed right back in to keep the criminal merry-go-round going. So it's a self-perpetuating organized crime and corruption exploitation continue to grow. Globally, illicit financial outflows total trillions of dollars. They drain hundreds of billions of dollars every year from the developing world. And one of the most important factors that make all this possible, banks. In 2019, Deutsche Bank faced fines and legal actions in multiple countries for its role in a $20 billion Russian money laundering scheme, known as the Global Laundromat. Between 2010 and 2014, the FSB and Russian organized crime, the two inextricably tied together, used Deutsche to move money into the West. How did that one work? Well, really short, high-level summary, UK incorporated shell companies loaning money to each other and then defaulting on fictitious debt. The money was transferred to Moldova and Latvia and back to Russia. Deutsche was too incompetent to notice. It took the OCCRP, the Guardian newspaper, and uh, Sudendeutsche Zeitung, a German newspaper, to break the story and tell the bank. And this was on the heels of another Russian laundering scandal in 2017, when the UK FCA fined Deutsche for allowing $10 billion laundering scheme, mere trades, run out of its Moscow branch. This year, German authorities went after the leaders of the Troika laundromat, another Russian money laundering scheme through the bank Troika Dialogue. The Troika scheme comprised some 75 companies in a complex web that ran as far back as 2006. FBME, Sada Bank, the list goes on. Russia helped protect Wirecard, easily deploying its online trolls and other internet bad actors to attack the short sellers and the journalists who raised questions about Wirecard. But Marsalek and his ties to Russian intelligence, possibly into Austrian intelligence, and German intelligence, remember Chancellor Merkel lobbying on behalf of China, remember her lobbyist, Karl Theodor Gutenberg, the former Minister of Defense, whose lobbying firm was advising Wirecard. Gutenberg was tied to Augustus Intelligence, a private firm also linked to far-right political parties, and who supposedly also had as a member the former head of the German Secret Service, Hans-Georg Maaßen. These ties raise serious questions. So we must ask, was it the GRU and FSB that protected Wirecard from being shut down sooner? We'll be back next week where we're going to take a hard look at the enablers, the lawyers, the accountants, the facilitators. Kyle, I greatly look forward to seeing what happens over the week and then checking in uh, as well. So thank you. My pleasure. We'll see you next week. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this special episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. As I said in the introduction, Mikhail, Ryder, Gordon, and myself are going to be taking a deep dive on the Wirecard case over the next several weeks. I hope you will join us again. This special podcast series will focus on the events uh, on the ground and each week, and then we're going to take a deep dive. Some of the topics we're going to cover include Germany, Inc., the regulatory response, what this means for the overall fintech and EU regulatory world, and a variety of other interesting angles to the Wirecard case. I hope you will stick with us throughout this series. I know you will find it incredibly enjoyable as this is one of the largest frauds uh, since the Enron Worldcon days and the largest accounting fraud in Germany since World War II. It's going to be a ton of fun. Thanks again for listening. Uh, Please leave us a review. We would greatly appreciate that on iTunes. This series on Wirecard is a special production 
of the Compliance Podcast Network.